what got me involved in what we call the culture war or just simply trying to be salt and light where we're at today was I went over to Bear County. I, I too had listened to Richard Land and he said that Judge Moore was wrong. And so I was telling my elders which we're Southern Baptist Church with elder rules, so you already know we're a little far to the right as it is. But um, uh, one of my elders says, I think you need to rethink your thoughts about uh, Dr. Land saying that the judge shouldn't have done what he did. I said, well, he's, you know, he's abusing uh, authority and he's not recognized. He said, well, I, I just ask you to re-look uh, that whole thing over and see whether or not uh, you're right in that. So I did. And a good friend of mine, uh, Wayne Robertson, who was then president of the Georgia Baptist Convention, was going to be in Winder for your second big rally, and Judge Moore was going to be there. And Dr. Robertson means so much to me. I pastored in his hometown. I'd known him for years and pastored in Valdosta. met him down there years ago. I said, well, if Wayne Robertson's going to that rally, it must not be all that bad. I think I'll go there and check it out. So we went uh, and had a private meeting with Judge Moore, and I, again, you got to think, now I haven't bought into this yet. I'm just trying, trying it out. And uh, so then they get all these uh, preachers and all these VIPs and they get them all together. And we're going to go over to the courthouse. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just running with the herd. I'm not really knowing what we're doing. I just know there's going to be a rally. I didn't see anybody. We entered the courthouse on the side that there was nobody over there. So we went in the front doors and went all the way through the courthouse onto the backside, and there were thousands of people, helicopters in the air, sharpshooters on all the corners of the buildings, and there was this platform set up right in front, of, right down in front of the courthouse, and so there are already people sitting out there, and the judge is already there, and there's nowhere else to sit because everybody there must be bad just because they took all the back rows. So me and my, this other elder that went with me, there was nowhere else to sit but on the front row beside the podium, like this right here. And Judge Moore's right there, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, I'm at this meeting. I don't even know if I believe this or not. And here I am sitting on the front row. If this thing, if something blows up, I'm going to be the first one to go because I'm sitting right here to probably miss the judge shoot me. I mean, it was amazing. And... Uh, and there I had my conversion. I had my Martin Niemöller moment where I realized that now was time for me to get involved. You know, Martin Niemöller, he, he said, you know, they came for the trade unionists. I didn't say anything. They came for the communists. I didn't say anything. They came for the Jews. and they didn't say any, I didn't say anything. They came for the Catholics, and, and I didn't say anything. And by that time, a knock came to my door one day and they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak. And I realized at that moment, sitting right there, as I watched out of the corner of my eye, Judge Moore speak from handwritten notes. I could see his hand shake as he turned copies of the Word of God and as he spoke to that crowd. I says to myself, self, this is the bunch you need to be with. It was like the Lord was speaking to me. And, I, and on our way back, me and, Andy, me and Randy Bannister looked at each other and said, what are we going to do? We got to be in. And from that, I got involved and, and just one thing led to another. You know, I ended up, uh, you're saying I'm a lobbyist with Georgia Right to Life. And my soul, that's the strangest, the second strangest thing I ever got involved in. Um, because... First of all, I never would have thought I'd been a politician either. I mean, I never thought I would have ran for office. Of course, I never wanted to be a politician. I always wanted to be a statesman. But to say that I'd be a lobbyist, you know, I mean, you know, you either smile or spit when you say the word lobbyist. And having to deal with that, how in the world I end up at a lot as a lobbyist? You see the picture up here uh, is a picture of me holding my first uh, granddaughter. I'm going to take my watch off. You know, Baptist preachers take watches off. You know what it means when they do that. It means absolutely nothing, but I do it for the ignorant. And it impresses people that, you know, I am, oh, there's, a, there's one right there. I guess I don't even need that. But anyway, that's Ada Grace. That's my second year at, at the Capitol, and uh, I've got three grandchildren. She's three years old now. Um, but I, I, the way it ended up was one day I was on my way to play golf in 2007, and Carol Swift, who was then president of Georgia Right Life, called me and says, Mike, I know why God had you lose that election. 
You see, the first strange thing that I did as I ran for state representative in 2006 when Sonny Perdue was up for his second term, and I ran against a 14-year Democrat incumbent, uh, I was a number one uh, rep race in the state of Georgia that year for Sonny's reelection. Between myself and the Republican Party, put over $300,000 into that race, four TV commercials. I'd raised $80,000 myself, not to mention the $225,000-plus that the Republican Party had put in in order to knock this guy out to add to the majority that we already had in the House. I got within 10 points of him two weeks before the election was, and all my people were telling me, you're right where you need to be to take this guy out. We're pouring the money in. Man, I was getting cards and letters from people I'd never heard of and lost by 30 points. Man, I was licking my wounds for days. Because, son, I had not only campaigned 12, 14-hour days, but I did it for seven months because I had to convince people, first of all, that a Baptist preacher is a citizen of the United States of America and he can run for office. <laughs> you know, and John Muhlenberg and others encouraged me as I studied the history of our great country that men of God have always been a part of what has happened in the early part of our country. And it took men who are willing to give of their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor to start this country, and it's going to take that in order to save it. Amen. It took nothing less to start it, and it'll take nothing less to save it. I remember where I was at, where I was sitting, when I was praying, holding my wife's hand, when I agreed that this is what God wanted me to do, and I did it. Have you ever lost an election? I have. Jody, you have. There's a real empty feeling after that especially when you had money and you did everything, quote, right. Carol says, i tell you why. Because I believe God's told me that the Lord wants you to be our lobbyist at the Capitol. We want you to be our legislative director. We'll pay you the same amount of money that you'd have made as a re state representative. You'll get a per diem. We'll get you a, a, an apartment, and you'll live in Atlanta four, to six, four months at least out of the year. And you'll be there and stand. You know the governor real good. You know Glenn Richardson real good, the speaker. Uh, the Republican Party's put a lot into you. We think you can make a difference for us. And so that's how I ended up at the Capitol. And so there you have, and the rest of the story is a lot of blood and guts, and we'll get into that if I get a chance. I, I want to try to stay uh, with my PowerPoint here because I, want, I, I really want to talk to you today about the issue of being pro-life and what it really means to be pro-life. I want to talk to you about personhood, mm -hmm. and it's an approach from a principled position of the sanctity of human life issue that we're dealing with. And where we want to begin as we look at that is begin looking at the Word of God, because we had a lot that you've talked about about that. And one of the things that I like about Georgia Right to Life is that we are faith-based. We believe in a biblical worldview. We're not here from a philosophical standpoint. We're not trying to argue from, the, from reason and rationale only. We believe that we get our reason and our rationale based off of what God has to say about something. And so we're going we're gonna to understand anything correctly. We've got to look and see what the Word of God says. And it says in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We base our belief in the personhood principle off of the word of God, amago Dei, meaning the Latin term meaning created in the image of God. There are a number of things that, dis that differentiate man from animal life. There are four dimensions which actually we could look at this morning that point us to the distinctiveness about the imagery of God being in all of us that creates within us our understanding of personhood and the sacredness of human life. You take God out of the equation of our creation and you have us as nothing but an animal. 
You know, it was Jeffrey Dahmer when he eventually, uh, somebody said he got converted. I don't know. I know a pipe wrench hit him eventually. But, uh, but he, when he was talking about what he was doing by way of consuming human beings as food, he, he rationalized it from the standpoint that he was always taught that he was nothing but an animal. Now, folks, there ought not be any surprise to us that when we're told we're an animal, that our children are being told that they're animals, that they act like animals. We shouldn't be surprised at that. And yet the imagery of God sets us apart from the animals. Let me give you, and it's not on the PowerPoint, but there are four dimensions that we need to understand that, that uniquely sets us apart. First of all, there's a spiritual dimension that's involved in that imagery. And by that, I mean we have within us the ability, because of what God does through his grace, to be able to know the Lord and to have a personal relationship with him. We can actually know the Lord God through the person of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a spiritual dimension. There's an eternal dimension that we have that animals can't have. They can't know the Lord in that kind of intimacy. They can't have personal fellowship with him, and they're not going to live on forever. I got in trouble the other day when I was preaching somewhere because I told somebody that their dog wouldn't go into heaven. But, but I hate to say that we just had one of ours got run over the other day, and I enjoyed that dog, and we had a great time, but, you know, there are not going to be any dogs in heaven. I just don't know anywhere in the Scripture that it says that. They don't, nothing eternal about them that's going to live on. Amen? So there's something different about us. We are going to live on. We're going to live on somewhere, either in eternal life or in eternal death. But we're going to live on somewhere, and so, we're going to, you know, the Bible talks about a spiritual death. We've all been born dead in trespasses and sin. And by the way, that sin that entered in in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis has, has marred that image of the Lord in us. I understand the fall has had a devastating effect. It, it separated us from the fellowship of God. But there's a, there's a spiritual death, there's a physical death, but there's also a second death that the Bible talks about, that eternal separation. And so that's different in us than from the animals. So there's spiritual, there's an eternal, there's a moral dimension that's different in us than in animals. You know, I had trouble with Pepper. She was the, uh, the uh, Dotson that had an inappropriate relationship with another dog. Hello. And I tried to talk to her about her fornication, and she really did not share those values with me. Uh, Pepper and Tootsie, that's the Boston Terrier, they're bad to steal each other's food. I tried to deal with them about your food's in this dish and your food's in that dish and you're not supposed to eat out of hers and she's not supposed to, and you know what? They would steal from one another. They didn't have that moral dimension of understanding right from wrong like we do. You're not enjoying this. Okay, let's go on to number four. There's a governmental dimension. Okay? A governmental dimension, and we see that directly in this text, a, a responsibility as stewards of what God has placed here on this earth. We begin with our own personal stewardship, and it begins to work right on down. And God's given us three great institutions to which to cover this stewardship that he's given us. There's, God's given us the home, he's given us the church, and he's given us government. And one of the things that I dealt with so much as a pastor getting involved in government, they would constantly say, what in the world are you doing getting involved in government? Don't you know that politics is for evil and it's wicked people? You know, and I would say, no, politics is not evil. It's only the people that get involved in it that makes it evil. And you know the quote, all that's required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And I want you to know today we're losing our best government by default. I used to go down in the lobby with Sadie Fields, and I saw for the first time that we are losing our government. It's not that it can't be changed. Two, four, six years, we have an opportunity to change the landscape, and we refuse to get involved. We continue to believe the lies that there's separation of church and state. Kind of sounds like Gomer Powell when he says, Says it's the rest, said it's the rest. Now it's separation of church and state, separation of church and state. Well, listen, there's a separation of church and state, but there's no separation of God from state. Hello? And I, got, I was getting tired, Stephen, of being, having to go down and lobby the people that I worked hard to get, to get elected. You would think when they told you what they said they believed that they would believe it. You know, honest people believe that people tell the truth. 
down at the Capitol, they tell me. I literally have had this said to me, do you know when a politician is lying? I said, when? His lips, when his lips are moving. And they laugh about it. It's a joke. And one dies every 24 seconds while we're slapping each other on the back and say, well, that pro-life issues aren't in the top 10 things that I'm concerned about. Well, let me tell you something, Hoss. Let somebody walk up to you and say you've got cancer and all of a sudden life just went to number one. And I've had four cancer surgeries and my daughter as well. Let me tell you something. It gets your attention. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. There is a proper order there. I'm not going to get to my PowerPoint if we just keep this up. <laughs> Somebody touched my button. I don't know who did that. What in the world is a Baptist preacher doing involved in politics? I said, have you ever been a member of a Baptist church? <laughs> Hello? Them monthly BMs, don't you look forward to them? Business meetings. Man, I'm telling you, Babs, they'll fight over a Dixie cup versus styrofoam cup all night long, son. Reading them financial statements, find out somebody didn't get approval. Women's military union, I mean the WMU, and other groups in there, I'm telling you, we're fighting and bidding, and I'm not knocking them. They're good folks. I'm just telling you, I've had some fights with folks. Turf wars, who's going, to run, who's going to run the church? Man, let me tell you something, man, nothing like, listen, everything's political. You can't even get into heaven unless you know the right person. Amen, more importantly, he knows you. And many he's going to say, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. You claim me, but I never claimed you because my nature never lived within you because I don't do those kinds of things. Well, where are we at? How do we get to this? Well, huh? I like Ronnie. Listen to what he said. He said, we cannot diminish the value of one category of human life, the unborn, without diminishing the value of all human life. We have gotten away from a Imago Day. In 1973, and since that time, we said that a baby inside of its mother's womb is not worthy of legal protection in the United States of America. That one statement that was sent down from the Supreme Court in 1973 has basically said this one thing, that if the murdering of an innocent baby inside of its mother's womb is not wrong. I want to declare to you right here today that, and I'm not going to use good English, but I'm going to give, give you good theology, they ain't nothing wrong then in this world. If it's not wrong to snatch a baby from the safety of its mother's womb, nothing is wrong in this world. You can choose anything, believe anything you want, and if you are big and bad enough and your stick is bigger or you got more people than the other somebody else has, then you can enforce your will for whatever it is if that is not wrong. And let me tell you something else, Mr. and Miss Southern Baptist, and y'all are not sitting here, so I is one, so that's how I preach at and fuss at all the time. You sit there snug and comfortable saying, it's never going to have anything to do with me. Oh, yes, sir, my friend, it's coming, it's coming to your house. Because let me tell you something, if a baby inside of its mother's womb is not safe, then, son, nobody is safe. Nobody is safe. There's nowhere you can hide. There's nowhere you can go that is, not, that is safe if a baby inside of its mother's womb is not safe. Let me tell you something, my friend. This is truly a womb-to-tomb debate. And there's a lot more things involved in this than what you think is just involved. Now, I don't like using this, but I'm going to tell you this. I, I didn't learn this language until I got to the Capitol. And maybe I need to have a brainwashing but I've been down there, this will be my fifth year. But let me say something. It's a term they use that it's not romantic. A term they use is sexy. It's a little more sexy to talk about abortion in a political sense of the word. People want to talk about that. But I want you to know something. Abortion is just the tip of the iceberg, Hoss. 
Oh, there's a lot more that's going on. If I do, if I were giving a two-hour seminar, I would show you about a 10-minute video clip from Johnny Erickson Tata, and she goes through the litany of all the things, especially coming from a lady like her sitting in a wheelchair. There's a lot of reasons why she's interested in us having a pro-life, yes, in our day and, ty- day, day and time, a pro-human agenda that we need to have in our country. It's just the tip of the iceberg of what's going on today. We got beginning of life issues, in vitro fertilization, embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, designer babies, infanticide, and eugenics. Yes, and these things are flourishing with little to no regulation whatsoever in the United States of America. And then you've got ending of life issues, assisted suicide, you've got euthanasia, you've got people with disabilities. Remember the Terry Schiavo situation that took place. You wouldn't treat a dog the way she was treated, and yet it was justified by our courts today. And then you've got the emerging technology, and this is what we call the Frankenstein. This stuff that makes your eyes cross. You've got the ectogenesis, an artificial womb that we think we're just years away from having produced where we'll be able to take those, hey, we'll have a good reason of what to do with those extra IVF babies left over that are in cryopreservation. How about 40,000 in America? We can stick them in the ectogenesis, and we can hatch them off at whatever stage we want and harvest their bodies kind of like napa auto parts you just go in there advanced auto you need some extra parts we'll raise somebody why it's not a human you see life begins at its earliest biological stage of development fertilization conception however you want to look at whether it's in a uterus or whether it's in a petri dish or test tube a life is a life it's a human being and it's worthy of protection These are the issues that we're dealing with, transgenics, chimeras. This is happening right over here with the University of Georgia right now, the mixing of animal and human DNA. I can show you pictures of things that they've already created and died. And then transhumanism, the $6 million man, Lee Majors, you remember that years ago, I think that was his name? We're not far from that kind of stuff. And, And they say that the country that's leading and the technology in this and interested in is China. I wonder why. Mix that with a, with a million man army and see what you get. But look, I want to take you back to 73 again and listen to what Blackman said. He said, if the suggestion of personhood of the preborn is established, the abortion rights case, of course, collapses for the fetus right to life is then guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. I didn't know this until I started working with Georgia Right to Life that he even said that. When this whole thing started, it all started on personhood, on whether or not they could determine. And he and the other justices said, we have not advanced far enough in our theology and our biology and our technology to be able to know whether or not even a baby inside the womb is even a person or not. But if it was, I would say that under the 14th Amendment, which was one of the three Reconstruction uh, Amendments, this one in 1686, which was pretty much, I think, retrospect back to 1857 um, in the court case, my mind just went blank, Dred Scott decision, which led to one year later in the Virginia Supreme Court to say that one of the justifications for slavery was that they were not persons, they were considered things, meaning the reason you could justify enslaving African Americans in the mind of many Americans before then was that they simply aren't persons. If they're not persons, you don't have to treat them as a person. They're not worthy of dignity, and they're not worthy of the Mago Day respect that they ought to have because of the imagery of God within them. Some people even believe that African Americans were animals at best. Property. But folks, we ought not be surprised about this. We treated the Indians that way. This was true up in Canada in relationship to women where they were considered for for penalties and and punishment. They could be seen as human beings, but not for rights and privileges. We saw this when we go to Germany. The reason they could treat the Jews the way they treated because they did not consider them under their definition of persons who were worthy of protection and respect under German law that they could not be treated the way they were being treated. They had justified it based off of their perversion of the meaning of personhood. And so the whole thing turns around this debate. 
you can go to personhood.org, I believe it is, and that's the site that has a chimpanzee on it. It's called The Great Apes. And it's, it's talking about they're trying to get personhood for, for monkeys now because they don't think they ought to be treated as property. It ought to be treated with certain rights and certain dignities for monkeys. Okay, what are the most basic rights? I mean, we all ought to know this. The unalienable rights, what are they? They're, first of all, it's life, which I think for all practical purposes, the Declaration of, uh, of, the Declaration of Independence was nothing more than the preamble to the Constitution. And by the way, the 14th Amendment has the Declaration of Independence in it. I've been told so many times by liberals that ain't that, that ain't nowhere in the Constitution on that life, liberty. Yeah, it is. You go read the 14th Amendment, it says that no person shall be denied their life, their liberty, or property, which is what, which is what the pursuit of happiness is, means being able to enjoy the fruit of your labor, not to go out here and have sexual intercourse with a dog or for two men to have sexual intercourse be the pursuit of happiness. That's not what that was talking about. Y'all look like y'all have never heard this before. If you ever get engaged with some of these folks in the culture war, they're going to throw this at you. And you need to understand what it meant to our founders when they used those terms. And it's used again in the 14th Amendment. But look, folks, this is, listen, when you can get these two, you can, you can go ahead and hunt the dog now. Let me tell you something. When you can get the Bible and history to line up, man, you better go with that. Listen, if every man be true, if God be true, let every man be a liar. All we need is the Bible anyway, by the way. Amen? I don't care what history says. But son, we got both. We got a country that is completely full of the fact that our, our country affirms the word of God. And what does the word of God say? The, the first and the most basic responsibilities of government are? They're basically two. To protect innocent life and to punish evildoers. The authority of the sword to take life was not given to me to get ticked off at you and kill you today or to either exercise my justice upon you for something that you have done wrong, but that's the government's responsibility. And God considers people that are involved in the government to be ministers. Matter of fact, some countries call it the ministry of defense, the ministry of interior. Where do they come up with this? It comes out of the Bible. So, my point is simply this, and I have argued till I am blue in the face at these guys at the Capitol. Well, it's just not on my top ten. I said, son, let me tell you something. If you can't protect innocent life, if you can't advance the ball incrementally, as you what you were talking about, Steve, on the life issue till you just bust through the, the goal line and score a touchdown, then I want to tell you something. If, if a government... If a federal government cannot protect innocent human life, it can't do transportation well. It can't do education well. And it flat dog can't do health care well. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not telling you when I have, when I hear, just quoted recently. Let's, let's get it real here. for let's, 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 let's not talk about somebody else's mailbox. Let's get right down here where it really counts. In the Gwinnett paper, Recorded, our Speaker of the House, David Ralston, said, I am pro-life, and I believe in the sanctity of human life, but. Now, folk, I've been dealing with Billy Goat Christianity for years. <laughs> I'd yield to Jesus, but. I'd quit drinking that liquor, but. I'd quit that, that adultery, but. I would, I would come to church every Sunday, but. That's, I call that Billy Goat Christianity. And we got Billy Goat pro-lifers. I'd be pro-life, but I'd do this, but I'd stand with you, Mike. Oh, I've had them sit there with me, Steve, and go, oh, man, we're with you. Oh, Mike, I, it, it's in my heart. Somebody said, yeah, they said, they said this, the other day this guy was trying to, he said, he said he held his heart when he talked about he was pro-life. Man, that don't mean fiddling to me. So when I get you out there in the woods, I want to see you hunt. We used to have an old dog named Whitey. And Whitey looked like death warmed over. Whitey would sit between me and my daddy, and I'd put my hat on him and poke fun at him, and he wouldn't even look at me. He wouldn't even lick his lips. He'd just sit there. But let me tell you something. When you open the door, and he saw that broom say, that rascal looked like somebody put a charge of lightning up him. <laughs> Woo! I mean, Whitey could do it. Look down at a hammer sitting in the truck. I'm serious. I put my hunting cap on him. We'd ride down the road, me and my dad, and the dog wearing a hunting cap. But son, could he hunt. Now, folk, I'm not interested in show. 
And I'm not interested in even bragging as I had one do the other day. Well, I've been faithful to y'all for 17 years. I've toted the water. I've stood for pro-life. I said, yeah, but you've, been, you've committed adultery for two of those years, the last two. And so I don't come up on your 25th wedding anniversary and talk about how faithful you've been to your wife and then in the same breath tell, oh, by the way, this last year I've been shacking up with somebody else. I'm here to tell you that one moment of infidelity can undo a whole lot of faithfulness. And so you won't get that endorsement unless you take your name off that bill. I don't care what you did in the past. What you've done recently will undo what you've done in the past. We endorse based off of what's happening right now, not what you did in the past. Where are you at right now? And that's something I have to be careful about records. Do we believe that folks can get saved and God change people? I do believe that. We have to investigate those records relevant to right now. Hey, I'd rather have better records than none records. Amen? But let me tell you something. I have seen people change. Do we not believe people change? Now, I don't have a lot of hope on deathbed conversions, but I'll tell you what, God can still save folk and change people. Well, got five minutes. Ten minutes. Well, hey, tell you, give me five, I'll take ten. What does Barney say? You give them 25, take 35, give them 35, they'll go 40. I can tell y'all don't listen to me, Barry. <laughs> y'all need to liven up a little. All right, this is, this is what it's all about. Human dignity, the sanctity of human life, personhood principle. Based off of this, this is what we believe. Georgia Right to Life promotes respect and effective legal protection for all human life from its earliest biological beginning unto natural death, and we do it based off of Imago Day. That's where we get our marching orders from the Word of God. And I could show you other scriptures that prove that God believes, whether it's Jeremiah or John the Baptist or Jesus, they were already who they were in their mother's womb, and God knew them right then. Now, this is one I like to lay on preachers, and probably none here, so y'all just enjoy it. Jump on your preacher when you get home. Y'all do do that, don't you? All right, no. All right, obligation to sanctity of human life issues. What are our obligations here to do something? Number one, we have a spiritual obligation to God. I mean, that's it. Chain of authority. I mean, where, is it, where are we answering to? Somebody asked me who am I going to vote for? I'm going to vote for the one that I feel like I can stand before Jesus one day and say this is one I voted for. I literally said, not too very, where's my direction? Somebody, you know who I'm talking about. When they were trying to justify their support for a certain leader in the house, I said, you're talking about me. You're talking about Dan Becker. You're talking about what Georgia Right to Life thinks. Let me tell you something. It's more important what God thinks about what, don't you do what Georgia Right to Life tells you. Don't you do what pleases Mike. Don't you do what pleases Dan Becker. You better do what pleases God. And if that makes Georgia Right to Life happy, fine. But Georgia Right to Life is not the standard. We're trying to hold the standard. We're not king makers. We're standard bearers. But God's this, you take God out of this situation and we're not even good glorified animal, animals. And then there's what I call a social obligation. Man, if you're lost as a goat, don't you at least care about your kids? In this slide, I'm going to put my three grandchildren up there. Ada Grace and Kirkland and Charlie. Charlie's a girl. Do you not care about them? You know, Jody, we've told our kids for years, man, we're going we gonna, to, you know, I don't know what kind of country our kids are going. Listen, I think this thing's going to collapse before we can get out of here. It's going, it's going south fast, folks. I don't think we're going to get out of here. I think the things I've been preaching about that I've been concerned about, I'm probably going to experience them. It's, it's, I'm going to experience them with my children and with my grandchildren at the, at the speed to which things are going today. Folks, listen to me. The greatest national disasters we've had have been natural disasters since 9-11. And we're killing 1.3 million a year. That's one every 24 seconds. Every day more people die in the abortuaries of this country than died on 9-11, and they've been doing it every single day since 9-11. 
God has already spoken on this issue, friends. He has said, I hate the shedding of innocent blood. I do not forgive the shedding of innocent blood. Let me tell you something. Do you think it's George W. Bush and Barack Obama that's keeping us safe right this very minute? No, they are not. It is God Almighty who has been our protector. And folks, we have taken his silence as approval too long. There ought to be a verse of scripture that says the chickens are coming home to roost because they're coming. If God does not judge this country in the present state of its slaughter of innocent human life, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, not to mention the Sodomites. That's just where we're at. That, that, that doesn't get me great reviews, but that's the truth. Obligation to truth. My soul, folks. We have an obligation to righteousness, that which is right, to stand by it. Once we've connected ourselves to Jesus, who is the living truth, we ought not have a choice to ever embrace what is wrong again. Uh-oh. And then there's our obligation to faithfulness. We have got to be faithful, friends. That, that, that transcends. You know why? People, I use these reasons why I ran for public office. God, I felt like God called me to do it. Now, folk, if God didn't want you to do it, then don't do it. But you see, we the people, I believe, equates to if my people. Hello. First three words of the Constitution, we the people. What's the first three words that will change this country? If my people. Listen, the problem with our country is not the whoremongers and the perverts and the homosexuals and the murderers and thieves. It's the people sitting in the pews. Listen, Jesus gave the law to the proud and he gave grace to the humble. <laughs> oh, my friend, we are the problem. We are the problem. That's why I ran. I had an obligation to my kids. I had an obligation to truth. This is the things that are wrong in this country and the things that are right that I need to stand for. I don't have a choice. And then I have an eternal obligation to stand there like Isaiah and say, Lord, hear my sin, me, and then get fired up about getting called. And then God said, oh, by the way, they're not going to listen to you. <gasps> well, there throws your pragmatism right out the window. There throws out electability, doesn't it? Because God says you stand for what's right. I don't care if it even works or not. Of course, he, and he says, well, how long I got to do that? He said, till the cities are laid waste and the country is destitute. Is that what it's going to take? Let me tell you something, folks. God does not judge nations in the afterlife. He judges countries. I mean, he judges countries in this life. He judges us in the afterlife. Countries are judged in this life. You don't find countries standing before the Lord one day. What I'm simply saying is we're going to give an account, but countries God's going to deal with now. And folks, there can't be a whole lot of time left. Now, here's what I was doing. And this is, I've got to get out of the way. And I'm going to read a poem, and we'll take up a love art. No, I mean a poem. Y'all keep the offer and I'll take the love. Well, this is what I've been trying to do as legislative director when I was there, and I'm still helping Dan out. Dan Becker is our, our lobbyist now, and, but I've been doing inspection. And this is what you need to do by way of getting involved. It takes inspection. People don't do what you expect. They do what you inspect. And you think just because you, you elected a guy with an R by his name and his mama goes to uh, Uncle Joe's church over there and we used to eat fried chicken with him and yada, 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 just know that that's not. Let me tell you something. There's some kind of funky something going on at the Capitol that when you get up there, there's this aura or aura, whatever it is, of the minutia of being up there that just kind of gets on you. And there's something about people who have never been around people who are at the Capitol, that when they get in front of them, they just absolutely melt. They can't take the power and, and, and the feeling of being around such power. And they bend to it and they give. 
But listen, if you don't understand life at the Gold Dome, baby, it ain't nothing like what you think it is in the districts. Totally different. Let me tell you the three things that will destroy it at the Capitol, gold, gals, and glory. And the halls are littered with them. They need inspection. Listen, you don't even plant a garden without coming back and doing some work. So, again, getting them elected is not the end. That's the front end. The second thing, they need education. And that's what I've been doing, and that's what you've got to do. for you. You've got to educate yourself. You have got to lay down that remote control, get out of that lazy boy chair, and find out what the Constitution says, what the Bible says, find out what's going on, and quit just believing just because it's on Fox News. Motivation. Here it is, Hoss. They don't see the light. Till they feel the heat. I had somebody tell, oh, we, we sent a letter to the chairman. Oh, we sent a letter to the chairman. So I, I said, you're wasting your time sending letters to the chairman. Why? He's the one that's got that bill. He says, you're going to hear. I said, folks, the chairman, no, there's no chairman anywhere in the Capitol that does of his own prerogative. It's all done by the caucus leadership, by the speaker, by the lieutenant governor, or by the eight-man committee or whatever. I'm just telling you, nobody's down there driving their own car. So if the bill's not going to get hurt, or if it's being heard, it may be put in a, in a, in a, in a committee. For, this, this, is the, this is the shucking and jiving that goes on down there. They'll put it in a committee and say, well, we gave it a hearing. Well, they put it in a committee that they knew that if they let them vote it like they wanted to vote, the bill would die. You know why? Because they didn't want it. I, I, listen, I had legislators who actually signed the Human Life Amendment in 2008, went to the speaker and said, I signed the Human Life Amendment, I co-authored it, but do not let it come to the floor. And he says, don't worry, we'll stop it. That way you can go back to your district and say, hey, I signed it. But the speaker's like, don't worry, we got you covered. Fooled again. Right. Fool them again. I sat in the former speaker's office, went through the flip chart with him, and tried to show him that the way he got his majority, he could keep his majority. He could stay with the social issues. He could stay with the other conservative issues. He could stay with a strong tax policy right down the line. He did not have to compromise on the life issue. But I just sat in the Capitol two weeks ago in a back room, and I heard, let me tell you something, Mike. This is what a guy told me. He says, a representative who used to be a Democrat, who's now a Republican, but he changed Republican years ago. He says, listen, they never intended to give you pro-life people but two bills during that first term of Sonny anyway as a pay y'all off for getting them in, and that's been it. And you know what? That's all we've had but the option of adoption bill for frozen embryos. That's the only thing we've got since then. You know why? Because, Steve, it's all about staying in power now. And we forgot the agenda. We forgot the agenda. Now it's about staying there. Listen quicker. I hadn't seen the hook. I know it. Activation. We got to get involved. Here it is. I'm going to close with one of my champions. That's Judge Roy Moore. Listen to what he said. Today we face another war fought not upon some distant shore, nor against a foe we can see, yet one as ruthless as can be. He'll take your life and children too. He'll say there's nothing that you can do. He'll make you think that wrong is right, tis but a sign to stand and fight. And though we face the wrath of hell, against those gates we shall prevail. In homes and schools across the land, it's time for Christians to take a stand. And when our race on earth is run, the battle's over, the victory's won. Even through all the earth, his praise will ring, and all the heavenly angels sing. T'will be enough to see the sun and hear him say, my child, well done. You kept the faith so strong and true, I knew that he could count on you. <laughs> 